Uh, we've got a speaker, our next speaker is somebody that I, I, would, I would imagine that all of you would know already. Uh, that is, if you know anything at all about the Heritage. How many of you here have heard of the Heritage Foundation? There you go. There you go. Oh, very good. So here's our next speaker. Kevin Roberts was named president of the Heritage Foundation in October of 2021. He succeeded former Heritage President Kay James, an old friend of mine, as the seventh president of the organization's 50-year history. In September 2023, Roberts was named president of Heritage Action for America and serves both organizations in a joint role. Roberts previously served as the CEO of the Texas Public Policy Foundation. He's a lifelong educator, earned his PhD in American history from the University of Texas. And after several years of teaching history at the collegiate level, Roberts in 2006 left the university to found John Paul the Great Academy, a co-ed K-12 Catholic liberal arts school in Lafayette, Louisiana. He served as the academy's president and headmaster for seven years. In 2013, he resigned from the academy to become president of Wyoming Catholic College. In addition to his doctorate, Roberts holds a master's degree in history from Virginia Tech and a bachelor's degree in history from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Roberts and his wife have four beautiful children and his oldest daughter is gonna be married soon. I'm excited for them and their family. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Kevin Roberts. Thank you, you're very kind. Well, it's, it's great to be here because this is America and when you leave Washington, where I have the privilege, but also the burden of working every day. It is good to be back in America, so God bless you for being here. I come with a message of hopefulness because we live at a time when the radical left, which I know something about, I'll tell you about how I got to know them as a young history professor, wants us to be discouraged. They want you to be sitting here in your tables right now and be despairing, not just about the future of America, which they hate, but they want you to be so despairing that you decide that you're no longer going to be politically active. And I'm here to tell you that now is the time, more than any other time in our lifetimes, to reject what the radical left wants you to be, which is to be discouraged, and instead dig ever deeper than we ever have before because this is the year, 2024, when we take this country back. You see, it's impossible for me as an early American historian to be in Pennsylvania, the birthplace of this country, and not be excited. 90 miles east of here, as you know, in the winter of 1777 and 1778, if you were at Valley Forge, you would have been very discouraged. In fact, if you were advising General George Washington in those bleak months of that winter, not only would you be cold, but you might in fact have been despairing because your men were shoeless. Some of them were dying of starvation. And yet, by God's grace, not only did Washington's army emerge from Valley Forge, as you know, but just three years later, they went on to conquer the most powerful army the world to that point had ever seen. I'm not necessarily suggesting that we're going to enter a season of warfare, my friends. But what I am suggesting is, at least figuratively, that the radical left has brought this culture war to our feet, and we darn well better wake up and fight it. I'm telling you something you know. Even more importantly, I'm telling you something that you not only know, but that you take action on every day. And so more than anything else, what I want to do for you today on behalf of all of us at the Heritage Foundation and Heritage Action is extend our gratitude for what you do every single day. Because you see, as I, I look out at the audience, and I know a few of you here, I know that you are the unsung heroes of the conservative movement in the United States. You are the unsung heroes of this generation. You are the unsung heroes, the people, the men and women who are in fact fighting what I like to call the second American revolution. And so for those of us, as I said, who have the privilege and the burden of working in the imperial city of Washington, I wanna tell you what we're doing for the first time to assist you with your efforts. We intend for these to be complimentary. You're the real experts about getting this done in this great state of Pennsylvania. And of course, 
you would say as Pennsylvanians that as Pennsylvania goes, so goes the country. I'm an adopted Texan. I might quibble with that sometimes. But today, here with you, I would say that you're right. And so there are three things I want to cover with you that Heritage is doing, and I want you to, if you don't already know, to see these efforts as being complementary to what you're doing. The first is we have to win this election. You see, at the large Heritage Enterprise, rather than being focused on specific candidates, we are instead focused on issues, those issues that bind us together as Americans. And we're pretty good, as I think all of you are, at speaking to our friends on the political right. But what we realized a year ago we needed to do a better job of is to cultivate a broader movement, to make sure that the silent majority of Americans, some of them who might have voted for your native son, Joe Biden, last time, that they might be willing to switch their votes in the spirit of common sense and believing in America. And so what we've been doing in all of the swing states that will determine the outcome of this upcoming presidential election for the first time is a wide-scale voter registration effort, which is vital. But the thing that we're even more excited about, as important as that is, is making sure that we're talking to the movable middle. And I'm going to give you a little bit of insight into what we have discovered. We've done focus groups in Pennsylvania, in Arizona, in Wisconsin, Nevada, and Georgia. And by the way, we're so excited about the prospects for this. We're looking forward to not only making sure that those states vote red, but we're going to flip Virginia red again, too. And so what we've been doing is basically based on what we've learned from those focus groups. These are regular Americans like all of you. But as I said, these are regular Americans who voted for President Biden the last time. These are people who are either unaffiliated voters, some of them even registered Democrats, and what they have told us unsolicited, because we're just trying to learn from them. Tell us what's on your mind, the facilitator of the focus group starts. And what they say is, basically, that what you and I recognize as the American dream is slipping through their fingers. And many of these unaffiliated voters who are open to voting the right way in 2024 are saying that they're less concerned about the particular candidates on the political right and far more concerned that they see what you and I believe in as the answer for restoring America. They lead with the problems with the economy. And not only do they tell us, as you and I know, if you drove more than a mile here, you know the price of gas, and if you drove a mile here, you know the price of gas too. Gas, groceries, and rent, they say, repeatedly in these focus groups, the cost of those have not only gone up, but very importantly for all of us, they know who's to blame. They know that, as Mary Catherine was talking about, the so-called Inflation Reduction Act is decidedly not reduced inflation, but increased it. They also know that the so-called Green New Deal, which is the most preposterous agenda since the New Deal, has dramatically increased inflation, dramatically increased costs, and they're ready to hold the administration accountable for initiating this. This is, this is like a layup in basketball if we get this wrong. But the second thing they tell us is really about the culture war. And the way they put it, these are not necessarily doctrinaire religious conservatives as I might be, is in terms of common sense. They say, why is it that in the United States of America, when our children go to their school, that teachers and administrators in that school think that somehow they replace us as parents? Why is it when we scrimp and save to send our children to college, that those college professors somehow think that they know more about American values than we do? And why, by the way, are we spending so doggone much money on an education system that is failing our kids? And then, yeah, this is a good question. I'll come back to that in a minute. And then the third thing they say is, whether we live in urban areas or whether we live in the suburbs, and even if we don't live in border counties, the lawlessness on the southern border is matched by the lawlessness in our urban core and also increasingly in our suburbs. And what they're telling us, friends, is, that's not the America they believe in. 
And number two, that's the America that they regret voting for when they cast the ballot for Joe Biden in 2020. So our objective at Heritage, in addition to the great work that you're doing, is to make sure that we're communicating with those people in a way that not only secures common sense votes in 2024, but helps to build our movement from a movement that's 50 or 51 percent of Pennsylvania or America to one that accurately reflects that 60, 65 percent of Americans agree with us. That's the opportunity we have in front of us. That's the opportunity that George Washington saw coming out of those bleak days of Valley Forge. And so let me paint you a picture of what's going to happen when the center right in this country is back in power in Washington. Because I happen to think that we're going to win a trifecta, the White House, the U.S. House, and the U.S. Senate. You see, it, it's, it's here I should tell you why I just reject all of the discouraging rhetoric from the radical left. And it's because about 20 years ago or so, I had the really bad sense to become a history professor. And I say really bad sense because I was the only conservative Christian professor in the entire College of Arts and Sciences at a major university in the Southwest. Now look, I knew what I was getting into and I sort of like mixing it up with my colleagues. But I was unprepared for how radical these people were. And that's now two decades ago. And so as I've made the professional transition from higher education to public policy work, first at the state level and now, as you know, at the federal level, I always remind people, audiences like you, that however crazy you think the academic radical left is, it's three times as bad. And with each passing year, they get worse, such that it is not an exaggeration for me to say, unfortunately, as I stand before you today, that the radical left hates this country, they hate what you and I believe, and they want to destroy everything associated with it. They have marched through our institutions, K through 12 schools, institutions of higher education, your universities, your alma maters, your churches, your rotary clubs, and they've taken them over. And when they do that, they deny us, just as regular Americans forget about our politics, where we can set up friendships. How many of you, raise your hand, have lost friendships or family, important family relationships because of your politics? That is the rotten fruit of the radical left. This is what we get to reject this year. But it has to start with the, the belief that we're not only going to win, but to my friends in Washington, D.C. in power who are elected officials, we're going to govern like conservatives when we do win. What does that look like? You've probably heard a little bit about this project that we have the privilege of facilitating at Heritage called Project 2025. Some people refer to that as a, as a heritage project. It's far bigger than that. We have over 100, 100 organizations who are part of it. Some of you in this room are part of it. We've had over 8,000 Americans submit their resumes to work in the next administration. Because you see, we operate under that Ronald Reagan maxim that people are policy. And so a year ago, when we published this 924-page book, Mandate for Leadership, the radical left thought that that was sort of the entirety of the project. And they were really scared because they had never seen the conservative movement do something at such scale. Little did they know that we were also recruiting several thousand Americans to be the people who would implement those policies. And so before I forget, let me make sure that I invite you to do what thousands of your fellow Americans and Pennsylvanians have done which is decide to tithe your most precious resource, which is your time and your talent back to the American Republic and submit your resumes at project2025.org. I don't care how old you are or young you are or in between. I do care that if you're a man, you identify as a man and if you're a woman, you identify as a woman. Because even though if you don't understand basic biology, you apparently can be confirmed to the U.S. Supreme Court, you may not be invited into Project 2025. 
What's going to happen when we run that trifecta? Well, first of all, the elected officials are ultimately going to decide this, right? Starting with the president-elect who gets to serve his second term. That would be President Trump. <laughs> Praise God. I suspect if Project 2025, with all of its associated organizations, has any influence on the next administration, you're going to see the following glorious things happen. We're going to see a new FBI director who select all deletes the code, the legal code that created the FBI and starts from scratch. You're going to see all of the federal regulation that prohibits investments in things like natural gas under the ground we stand from being harvested for the benefit of prosperity and freedom. That is all coming to an end. The name of, in the name of environmental social governance, all these regulations and ridiculous criteria that corporate boardrooms use will come to an end. But as you might imagine, I have a personal favorite, and that is, once and for all, we are going to eliminate, tear out, root and branch the most rotten part of the federal government, which is the U.S. Department of Education. And as if that weren't enough, I'm really glad to report that not only people in the Republican Party and people in the center, but a growing number of Democrats, believe it or not, in Washington and elsewhere recognize that the greatest adversary the United States has ever faced, the Chinese Communist Party, needs to be named as such, and we need to defeat them before they invade our ally, Taiwan. And we, we're such optimists at the Heritage Foundation, we believe that we will defeat them, by the way, not with outright military conflict, but by recognizing that the Chinese Communist Party ought not have been able to infiltrate our universities, our schools. They sure as heck should not have the right to hire K Street lobbyists and lobby for them in the United States Congress. By the way, it's, it's here I should mention too, you're going to hear from a lot of candidates for political office in your wonderful commonwealth. And let me just submit to you with great humility on behalf of Heritage that any of them who when you ask them the question, do you want to defeat the Chinese Communist Party, if they hem and haw around that, they should not be elected. That is the defining issue. Because you see in Pennsylvania where you have one of the most untapped largest resources of natural gas in the world, the issue of confronting China is very much connected to the issue of our energy production. And anyone, especially in your commonwealth who doesn't understand that, shouldn't be running for office. So, Project 2025, to conclude this point, is an ambitious agenda. I was asked earlier this morning by a Washington Post reporter. See, at Heritage, we talk to everybody because we're not afraid of standing up and speaking for what we believe in. She asked me, Kevin, what percentage of Project 2025 is going to be implemented? And I said, well, that ultimately is going to be up to President-elect Trump and his administration. And she said, so you really think he's going to win? I said, yes, because God still smiles on America. <laughs> Not that you should be reading the Washington Post, but if you happen to do that tomorrow, just see if somehow that comment got put in there. <laughs> I bet you a dollar it won't be. The third thing that I want to talk about, and I'll conclude with this point, is a little more abstract. I mean, it's referring to a real event, the American Revolution, but in a way that really is abstract, because as I mentioned before, 
I think we're in the second American Revolution, which up to this point, at least as it relates to us, has been bloodless. But you see, the American Revo second American Revolution has not been bloodless. The lawless, open southern border takes the lives of innocent people across this country every day with the scourge of fentanyl, the leading cause of death for Americans under the age of 35. The scourge of lawlessness, which has been explicitly advocated by district attorneys, mayors, governors, and even our current president of the United States, costs lives and our cities all the time. What I'm saying about the second American revolution is that we reject all of that and we get busy with not only winning elections, not only governing like conservatives, but every single day in our homes, our neighborhoods, our churches, our professional associations, genuinely putting smiles on our faces because one more time, one more time in this great republic with our backs against the wall, we're gonna emerge from Valley Forge and we're gonna charge the hill and we are going to take this great country back. Thanks for being part of it. God bless you.